First of all, thank you and congratulations to the many lectors who proclaimed the gospel today. If you notice, before the proclamation of the gospel, three of them came up and asked for the blessing of the priest because ordinarily only the priest proclaims the gospel. But since we have the very long story of the Passion, then we have delegated the reading of the gospel to our lectors, including our choir. And yeah, that is a moment where we can say that they deserve thanks for this, because we together have read a very wonderful story. It's a very significant story for all of Christendom because it is about the passion of the Lord. You notice that today as we start the Holy Week, we start with a color red, which signifies the blood of Christ. It is not Valentine's Day where we wear red, but the gospel has a similar proclamation. It is about love. It is not Chinese New Year. That's why it's red. But the gospel has a similar proclamation, and that is, it is about newness. There is something new. So in other words, put these celebrations together, a celebration of love or a celebration of newness, renewal, new time, then that is the meaning of Holy Week. That is the meaning of the events that we are celebrating this week. And especially the diocese urges us, has been urging us through Lent to reflect on our unity with Jesus, our being one with the Lord, our teacher, our Lord in the Eucharist. And that is why it is in the Eucharist itself that all these celebrations find expression. Why? Because the Eucharist is a gift of love. That is why we proclaim God's message of love when we celebrate the Holy Eucharist. And it is the same message of love that we find proclaimed in the Gospel today. Why? Why is the suffering of the Lord, His passion, and His death a message of love? It is because in His life-giving, in His self-offering, we find the highest expression of love. Jesus tells us, Greater love no one has than to give his life for his friends. And so self-giving is the highest expression of love. It is very important that we have our young people with us in this Eucharist. I'm not saying that the older people are not important anymore. But you see, the older people, including me, we already know how it is to live in the world. But the young people, they have yet to live their lives in the world. Soon they will be falling in love, or they are in love. But what kind of love? Soon they want to give themselves in love. Asking the blessing of their parents because soon they will live lives of their own because they are in love. And that's a beautiful thing. But still, we shall ask the question, is that really love? How do you know that you are in love? How do you know that that love is strong enough to last? We don't know. 
but sometimes there are signs. Maybe we can say that love will last if it is pure, if it has pure intentions. Or sometimes we would say that love will last if there are actions that back up that love. Or we could say that, that love will last if we are prepared to work for that love. But whatever it is that we say about love, it is not real love if it is not coming from God, if it is not the grace of God. And so love is a gift. And the highest form of gift is that we could hardly reciprocate it. We could not actually pay back to God His gift. That is the meaning of the highest form of love. A love that is ready to die for the sake of the beloved. That is difficult. And so, my dear friends, Christian love is not just the love that we celebrate on Valentine's Day. It's a more difficult love. Love that is ready to die for the beloved. In the reading today, in the Gospel proclamation, you notice that Jesus only has few words. There were more words for the crowd, paragraphs for the crowd, even more words for Pilate, trying to interpolate Jesus. So this entire gospel passage, more words are said by people, by the crowd, not by Jesus. Jesus has only one-liners. But there is, at the middle of this gospel proclamation, there is one paragraph devoted to Jesus. One paragraph. And sometimes, we don't memorize the paragraph. We don't even know it. We only know the one-liners of Jesus. Like, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Into your hands I commend my spirit. One-liners. But at the middle of the gospel today is one entire paragraph that Jesus said. I would like to read it again because I know you might have missed it. This is what Jesus said. Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me. Weep instead for yourselves and for your children. For indeed the days are coming when people will say, Blessed are the barren, the wombs that never bore, and the breasts that never nursed. At that time, people will say to the mountains, Fall upon us, and to the hills, Cover us. If these things are done when the wood is green, what will happen when it is dry? Very long. We can say that this is the last sermon of Jesus, the last homily. And for whom? was he addressing this? He was addressing this to the large crowd of people that followed him during the carrying of the cross. So imagine Jesus carrying the cross. Imagine a large number of people. Jesus, who was already suffering, still noticed that there were people willing to hear him. And so he preached a very eloquent homily. They were sad. They were crying, including women who mourned and lamented. Jesus addressed their sadness. Jesus addressed their weeping and their lament. We might ask, why are they weeping? Why are they sad? Why are they lamenting? Well, it's because they know Jesus will die. He will be crucified like a common criminal. Well, they know that he has no sin. 
Maybe they are his fans. So they are crying. But Jesus was also able to look at their hearts. Jesus knows the hearts of the crowd. Everyone in the crowd. Even like this morning, everyone here. Jesus knows what's in their heart. And if we put ourselves into the story, we have the natural tendency to protect ourselves, to defend the life that is given to us. That is why they were sad. That is why they were crying. And Jesus proclaims that his love is even greater than our natural reason. The love of God is even greater than our impulse when we tend to defend ourselves or when Jesus who is innocent is condemned right in front of you you will defend that person because you are right you are right that he is innocent and yet even over and above that the love of God Jesus shows that love and thus proclaims that the object of weeping should not be him. Do not cry for me, but actually for yourselves and for your children. And at the same time, Jesus recognizes that you are right in trying to defend Jesus. You are right in your conviction that Jesus should live you are right when you are sad that Jesus will go. That is why, towards the end of these celebrations, He will give us the Eucharist. He will give us a gift of Himself that will cure, that will cure our hearts when we miss Him. Because that is part of human love. We miss people. So when Jesus dies, when he returns to the Father, his disciples will miss him. Even that, even for that, Jesus provides. At the Last Supper, Jesus left a legacy of, like a reminder to us, a souvenir that we should not forget his perpetual self-giving. My dear brothers and sisters, when you ask, what kind of love do I have? What kind of love do I feel? It means for a Christian asking, is this like the love of the Lord? Is this a kind of love that is totally self-giving, ready, to die for the other. So this week when we celebrate the rituals that remind us of the self-giving of the Lord, let the Eucharist be the source of all graces because the Eucharist keeps the self-giving of Jesus in our minds and in our hearts and we are joined to him in a new covenant. The Eucharist unites us to Jesus, who is life himself. And so we pray that as we begin our journey through this Holy Week, we offer to the Lord all our lives, all our concerns. And as he gives us his own life in total self-giving, may we too be renewed by his life in us.